Welcome to episode four. I guess episodes now. That's what we're doing in the new normal. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, the Insider Guides industry webinars where we uh, where we take a deep dive into the sector, uh, the international education sector in Australia, and we uh, examine different elements of how the sector is responding. Uh, I would like to thank you all for for, for joining us and taking the time here. Um, we are focused on a sense of practical optimism as the sector moves through this COVID-19 pandemic. My name is James Martin. Uh, I run Insider Guides uh, and we create guides and, and uh, online content for international students. And we try and prepare, welcome and support them as they come to Australia. We also help organisations who just want to promote their brand to international students and we also create some custom content, things like that. Uh, at the end of this webinar, you will be invited to complete a short survey, uh, which you'll get automatically. I uh, would love to get your feedback on this and, um, uh, and, and that will just help us improve as we move forward. And there will be new, uh, if you have any ideas for new ideas or new guests, please let us know. This is a Q&A format, so please do feel free to ask questions or chat in the box to your right uh, and, uh, and, and we will try to uh, get to them uh, throughout, the, throughout the webinar. Um, I'd like to introduce the two speakers we have today. Uh, the first, well, the, the, the second speaker, uh, Gary Lee, was, uh, um, he was originally was going to join early on, but um, he's, a, he's a late, uh, he's a late panelist. <laughs> we're, very, we're very lucky to have him though. Um, uh, and so we're very excited to do that. So the first speaker we have is the Honourable Phil Honeywood. And Phil has been the IEAA's, the International Education Association's CEO, uh, since November 2011. Previously, he was the, a member of the Victorian State Parliament, uh, the Minister for Tertiary Education, Training and Multicultural Affairs, and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition between 2002 and 2006. Phil is currently the Chair of the new Global Reputation Task Force, working to address the massive impacts across the sector from the bushfires and now COVID-19. IEAA is Australia's leading association for international education and together with affiliated bodies, corporate partners and government, they work to promote the benefits of international education to the broader community. Uh, we are delighted. Phil has been able to take the time, what must be a very busy time for him and the association. And, and the second speaker we have is Gary Lee, who uh, as many of you would know in the student support area of the sector, he's a bit of a, a legend. Certainly I've known Gary for about 10 years uh, in yeah. the sector, um, has worked in the international education sector for over 18 years and specialising uh, in the development of strategy, programs, events and volunteer management. And Gary was the 2016 New Australian of the Year uh, for his accomplishments in supporting international students and promoting cultural diversity. He advocates for the welfare of international students in Australia and is an ambassador for Welcome to Australia. Bully Zero Australia Foundation, the AFL Multicultural Community, and Melbourne Victory, who uh, for me is actually my arch rival soccer club. Uh, but <laughs> we'll forgive that. Um, oh, he is also uh, the, uh, the International Education Coordinator at the City of Melbourne. So, yeah, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. Thank right. you. Right. Cool. Thanks, so, I'd like to sort of introduce and unpack what we're doing here. I mean, in the face of a pandemic, the concept of globalization as an indicator of human progress is certainly being tested. Countries are shining a light on the policies that brought in new money and new labor and helped foster soft power. But for international education, the past few weeks have been uncertain and really difficult for the sector as every part of it is impacted in totally different ways. International students themselves, they find themselves in a state of limbo where many have lost their jobs, which they used to pay rent and course fees. And while the Prime Minister has stated that if international students are unable to support themselves, they may have the, op they have the option to return home to their home country, for many students that's just not possible yeah. or practical. And nor is it a message that most of the sector want to send out in a time when students need support. For the sector itself, institutions and associated businesses look for guidance from Canberra and across the sector as to how we move through this. But what if that support doesn't come? What if international education is destined to weather this storm alone? 
And that's what I'd like to unpack today. And I think I've, I've found, uh, scoured my little black book of contacts across Australia. I think I've got two of the most interesting, insightful people who come from different angles on this issue. And I'm really excited to, to unpack this with everyone here today. So Phil and Gary, I'd like to sort of start if we go back in time to last November. Uh, and I'd just like to get a feel for what it looked like. What did the sector look like? So Phil, I'm, if we start with you, I'm wondering if you could paint a picture of what international education looked like in Australia before this crisis happened and where was Australia in its strategy in around November last year? Thanks, James. Well, unfortunately, Australia has got a reputation amongst our global counterparts and fellow study destination countries as being overly concerned about making the dollars. And I'll give you an example. At the moment, I chair on behalf of IEA the Global Network of International Associations, which includes NASA, uh, the European Association, Latin American uh, equivalents, Canada, etc., and Africa. And when we get together, we discuss issues such as scholars at risk, where many of these, um, our counterpart countries and organisations are bringing in um, uh, academics who are at risk in their home countries of uh, torture, whatever, providing them with make-up jobs to get them a visa to get them out of their country. That's one element. Another element is that, of course, many of the European countries and Canada mm -hmm. are doing incredible work in providing um, shadow student cards for refugee students who uh, can't officially enrol in an institution in Europe or Canada, but they'll be given a student card and allowed by the university or the institution to come to lectures and even sit exams. So there's a number of initiatives that our, counterpart, our counterpart organizations and study destination countries are doing that is really holding Australia up very badly by way of comparison because it's just been about money, money, money. And of course, that's been the headlines in the media. Uh, unfortunately, when the pandemic broke out, I kept on being hassled by journalists about, well, Phil, what's it gonna cost Australia's economy? And so I think the narrative has to change. The narrative has to be about, well, these are young people who are gonna be future leaders of their countries in many mm -hmm. cases. If we don't show them empathy, support in an unprecedented crisis, having made $40 billion a year off their backs for more than a decade now, then what type of country do we aspire to be? What type of soft power do we think we'll actually gain by shutting the doors to them both literally and figuratively? And where do we hope to be as a country that's sort of held in high esteem by others going forward? Mm. Yeah, I'd love to unpack that a little bit more as you move through this topic to sort of work out how we're, how the sector is responding from different set, different parts and, uh, and, and the role that the government needs to play in that. But um, Gary, before we jump into that, I'd love to hear from a Melbourne yep. perspective, what, what was the city looking like back in November of 2019 and the, and the impact that international students had on, had on the city? I think last year was a really good, good um, place for us uh, before, before all this happened. We've got a few questions from, from our guests that talked about employability and internships. And last year, City of Melbourne made a commitment uh, to run an, um, to standardize or to run an internship program within Melbourne City Council. So uh, we went out there with the aim of working with all education providers uh, through um, we we had two breakfasts with with colleagues and our aim was to get 200 interns within the city of Melbourne and it was something that the councillors were very supportive of our CEO was very supportive of so we we're very excited in that space because that's where we wanted to go uh, we feel a lot of international students at that stage were coming to us to say that uh, when you talk about a sense of belonging and value for money in terms of an international education then employment is the key outcome from their presence um, from the attendance here. So uh, that's interrupted, obviously. And when we talked about November last year, I don't think we knew what was going to happen. Um, we, we only noticed a big influx of concerns from international students probably early this year. I still would, would agree uh, last year and early this year, we were all uh, caught up with the bushfires. So uh, at that stage, I was working with some of the peak bodies like Bigwise about um, placing international students in regional Victoria as potentially a pathway to employment and pathway to permanent residency. And the bushfires were happening. So we were going, oh, this has thrown a rock in the works. How, how are we going to work around this? But it was quite, 
quite act active. I think it was proactive. We, we were doing a lot of things that we felt were going to benefit international students. But when January hit, uh, it's quite ironic because I was actually traveling through Asia during that time uh, to Japan and Malaysia. Um, and when we started hearing news about the virus, I thought, oh, this will pass. So little did I know that when I come back, it has taken over our lives, literally. So, um, so City of Melbourne is taking a leadership in that space. I'm really proud of what the Lord Mayor and councillors have committed to helping international students. And we can only do this through partnerships with the sector. So uh, with what Phil is doing, with what the universities are doing, we just want to be able to add value to those initiatives. Well, yeah, and I think that's a, 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 a fascinating uh, insight as to where we were. And, and just, just as we enter into January, I mean, Phil, we started this year with prospective international students thinking that large areas of Australia were on fire, um, if they were to an extent. Now we're hit with a global pandemic, not the easiest start to, to 2020, especially in a sector that is acutely sensitive to the drivers of globalization, such as human movement and immigration policies. Phil, you've, you've, uh, you're, you're on the global reputation task force that Minister Tian has put together. Can you tell us a bit about the evolution of that task force and how this sector is being represented at that level? Thanks, James. Well, it started out, as you've correctly pointed, to the bushfire pandemic. Oh, sorry, it's a separate pandemic, <laughs> the bushfires. Oh, it's and, all one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, joined together. Um, Minister Tian phoned me and said, look, what should we do for the international education sector to try and ensure that we really get over some of these messages about the whole of Australia being on fire. Uh, also about climate change, obviously a lot of European and North American students and their families felt, well, Australia's doing nothing to really prove itself being concerned about their carbon footprint and climate change. So why should we send our child or why should I as a young person study in a country that uh, uh, doesn't acknowledge climate change as being a, a massive issue? Mm. So we put together the task force, 28 members, uh, including one senior representative from each state and territory government, including um, Gary Lee, <laughs> including um, uh, a number of federal departments, so immigration, trade, um, obviously Rebecca Hall from Austrade. Uh, we had um, education and we had immigration. Um, and we also put together all the peak bodies, so University of Australia, TAFE Directors Australia, um, English Australia and so on. And we've been meeting literally every week now since January. The crazy thing was that we'd had our first meeting, which Minister Tian chaired, and then a week later, he was literally up, um, fixing up uh, burnt farmers fencing um, on Australia Day, phoned me on his way back from wherever in um, uh, country Victoria, and said, could the task force now take on the issues of, around the coronavirus? And little, little did we know that that was gonna carry on now for 12 meetings. We've got another one this Friday. I should just point out to webinar participants that it is incredibly frustrating. We had some early wins from the national regulators, so from ASPA and from TESCA, where I've personally phoned the, ASPA, the TESCA CEO, for example, and the ASPA commissioner, and asked them what flexibilities they could come up with, with supporting online delivery for education providers, flexibility around start dates, around academic progress, all the usual regulatory issues and barriers that we are up against as providers. And they really hit the mark. They did a fantastic job in being as flexible as any national regulator could be. And I think they deserve appropriate plaudits for what they've achieved. Contrast that with Home Affairs. I've got two senior representatives from Home Affairs on the line every Friday in the task force meetings. And for 12 weeks, we've been hammering away about visa flexibility. It's got to the point where I've gone to Alan, Alan Tudge, the acting immigration minister, and given him a list of about 12 visa flexibilities that other study destination countries like NZ, like Canada are offering to their students and that we're not offering. And to give an idea of how crazy that can be, two weeks ago, Home Affairs put out a provider update saying if, you, if your student visa expires, then basically bad luck, you have to apply for a whole new visa and that's going to be $600, whatever, you have to go through that process. New Zealand, by contrast, UK, by contrast, has said, if your visa's expired, don't worry, 
will automatically extend it until the end of September. So my frustration is with Home Affairs. I have to say the other departments, like the Health Department, the Regulators, Education Department, have been doing the right thing in terms of providing us with important feedback on action items after each meeting. So uh, we've had a few wins, we've had a few losses, but because the task force brings everybody together and we can all vent <laughs> um, and uh, try and work out ways forward, then it is a worthwhile in initiative. Uh, occasionally, Minister Tian joins us to listen to our tale of woes, um, but at least we've got some way, some manner and mechanism in which to really try and represent the sector as much as possible. Yeah, and I can imagine it must be a very frustrating experience, especially when you know the sector is is feeling it so so much, and uh, and at a federal level, there's a, it, it does tend to tend to it does tend to feel that they're not they're not listening. Um, but yeah, as we move through it, I mean, I, I, Gary, I'd love to hear from your your perspective. What do you feel students are asking for now? I mean, what's your uh, what are you hearing from student advocates directly? Uh, so interesting times, obviously. So I think we've we've seen in the media what international students are worried about. Uh, they're talking about rent reduction. We're talking about fee reduction. We're talking about um, loss of casual jobs. Um, but I think what's what we need to address is the they're feeling anxious because they feel that there's just a general lack of care um, and concern from government and universities. I think there's a lot happening in the space, uh, but they are not necessarily communicated well to international students. So uh, all they remember is that statement from the, uh, from the Prime Minister, hence, hence anxieties are quite high. Um, at CDU Melbourne, when we look at it, I think there's almost three different groups of international students with diff different problems. We've got those who are most vulnerable, so we're, we're probably those in survival mode. So they can't pay their rent, they can't pay their fees, they can't access food, they can't buy groceries. So there's lots of work being done there around food banks and, and free meals with restaurants within the municipality. Uh, even issues as simple as internet provision. Uh, a lot of students go to our libraries across the municipality to access uh, Wi-Fi, now have lost that, that connection, literally. Um, so it's easy to say study from home, uh, online courses, but a lot of the students cannot afford to or don't have the facilities to adapt to it. Then I guess the second group is the should I go or should I stay or should I go group. Uh, students who are a little bit more established, but I'm sure what they can do. So whether they should return home and do the courses online, whether they should continue to stay here, what does that mean for them? Um, so a lot of these students are now talking about fee reductions and what universities can do for them. Where can they go uh, to, get, to get help? Um, and then I guess the last group will be the ones who are graduating. So their concerns are completely different. I guess you're talking about post-study work rights. How is this going to impact that? Will there be jobs for when I graduate? They're talking about how am I going to finish my, my course? Um, they have got concerns about families as well. And I guess when you're talking about uh, international students are graduating, a lot of them uh, have applied for permanent residency as well. So they're going, how is this going to impact their stay? And I guess there are some students who fall into all three categories, which makes it very, very complex. For CDM Moment, I guess our target at the moment is at the most vulnerable communities and how we can help them um, sustain living in, in Australia. So. Uh, a lot of students are frustrated, but we also need to know that international students are very resilient. And talking to some people in a sector, we want to encourage international students to go out there and find out what they can get, what support they can get, as opposed to what they want. Uh, so I think that's quite, quite different. Um, and they need to know that the sector is working really, really hard in finding solutions, but with everything, it takes time. Yeah, it's... Uh... It is what what you said about international students being resilient. I think that's uh, it's absolutely true. From what I'm ex from what I'm experiencing, just the last week talking to international students, and um, you know they you go on these forums and these students are saying things like, "Oh, I've lost my job. What do I do?" And then some other students are like, "Oh, it's totally fine. Just go go work with go get an Uber Eats job, and here I'll lend you a bike." And um, and then oh, I got pulled over from working for working an Uber, an Uber oh, Eats job because it's not not an essential not an essential service and they're like oh yes it is and these students are just trying to make their way through this and i think that's a, a great testament to the kinds of students these these are but i'd love to sort of I'd, I'd love to unpack that a little bit more a bit later but phil um, just over a week ago 
the Prime Minister came out and essentially told international students that they should return home if they can't afford to stay here. Comments echoed by Education Minister Dantian. How much brand damage do you think that was that actually did to, to the sector? Well, I won't uh, tell you, James, you know, what I said when I heard that comment from the Prime Minister. <laughs> it's unpublishable. Um, <laughs> really, really, what happened was, um, according to people close to the Prime Minister's office, uh, allegedly he was talking about backpackers, and he got then asked a question, well, does that include international students? And he said, well, yes, they should go home uh, as well. Now, I mean, I'm not going to make excuses for any um, politician who, uh, I guess, dissembles there. And, some people have argued it was actually dog whistle politics, we'll never know. But what really, uh, I guess, has upset me is that then all the momentum that we had been building up in trying to show Australia as a caring um, yeah. study destination country was then largely lost and we had to backpedal. And uh, things were achieved like behind the scenes. Like I spoke to Minister Tudge, the acting immigration minister, and I got him to include in his media release, his media comments that he looks forward to further discussions with the international education sector, which was his way of flagging that there's going to be some sort of backpedaling, there's going to be some sort of, um, how can we put it, um, winding back on the Prime Minister's comments down the track. Now, okay. I was told by a very influential advisor about two days after the PM made those comments that we only had a, the sector only had a four out of ten chance of getting a national hardship fund for international students in dire need established. I was told yesterday that they're rating it a six out of 10 chance now within certain government circles. So we're gradually going to get to the point, hopefully, where the federal government will provide seed funding for um, international students in genuine need. Why, why am I pushing, and IA is pushing for a national hardship fund? It's because neither major political party are willing to let non-Australian citizens access job keeper or job seeker welfare programs. So we can keep fighting that good fight, but I just don't think it's going to eventuate based on all the discussions I've had with Labor and Liberal. The Greens have been, of course, okay on that. However, um, when it comes to alternatives, the best alternative would surely be to have one coordinated national hardship fund which the federal government would be expected to put substantial seed funding into. And then we could have state governments, city governments like City of Melbourne, philanthropic foundations, and also education providers, package that all up into one sort of common sense approach where individual international students could apply and prove up their need and be given cash grants and food vouchers and so on. And unless we do that, in a coordinated manner, we're going to have this sort of hodgepodge of City of Melbourne pledging, you know, $50,000, whatever, um, Deakin University putting up $25 million. And that's not going to send out a great message offshore to say that we've got our act together, that we are showing some sort of national coordination of support for students in dire need. Um, so we're not going to do what New Zealand or the UK have done and provide our international students who've lost their part-time jobs with access to the welfare programs like JobKeeper, then at the very least, we need to have a coordinated response by way of a national hardship fund. Now, just to quickly sum up on where we're at with that, the Queensland government wrote a letter to the Prime Minister, which I helped them draft, calling on him to establish the fund. Today, Study New South Wales is sending a similar letter to the Prime Minister, and we've got one going from Study Perth. So we have also had some individual um, major uh, business people write to the Prime Minister in a similar manner. And so we're starting to get momentum for that hardship fund. And I'm quietly confident that it will happen. And it won't be as good as New Zealand or UK, but it will be something. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's very promising. And, and, and we all appreciate the hard work that, that, that all the various players and, and yourself are, are doing to, to bring that sector to the forefront of, of government consideration for some level of concession. But I would just like to sort of take a step back and go into what exactly is on offer for international students as of today. 
um, if we go through what, what, what is there available. So international students can access their superannuation if they've been here for longer than 12 months. They are currently allowed to work at major supermarkets and aged care over and above their 40 hours a fortnight. However, I only just found out this morning that the supermarket one actually runs out on May the 1st and then have to go back to the 20 hours, 20 hours a week, 40 hours a fortnight, um, which I didn't know uh, until just then. And then, as you mentioned, Australian universities and some accommodation providers have launched hardship funds now totaling about $110 million. However, as you said, no access to job seeker or job keeper. Then um, the feedback that we've been getting from international students has been pretty uh, incredible. They, for example, a scenario that, that we've seen has been that um, a local Aussie can do a two hour shift in a cafe and uh, they're entitled to the full $1,500 a, a fortnight payment. Whereas if an international student works 20 hours a week, uh, they get nothing. Um, Phil, you mentioned a little while ago in a statement that you felt that, that if we don't act, international students will be homeless. Uh, how, do you, how, how big do you think this problem is going to get? And I'll go to Phil first and then to Gary. Well, another issue there with accommodation, James, is we've got no um, real clear oversight on whether international students will be able to qualify for the same type of rent um, eviction sort of uh, moratorium or whatever that Australian yeah. citizens can achieve. And th again, that's another one we're trying to argue through the task force. Well, if it's good enough to have a um, eviction moratorium on Australian citizens, then the same should apply to international students. The, te the same tenancy arrangement surely apply to everybody. Um, so yes, I can see a situation in which there will be genuine homeless um, students. And I think Clearly, for any federal government, once we start getting TV footage of that, then that might respond more. Or they might respond with more empathy and more support. But for our reputation as a welcoming study destination country, do we really want to have to wait for young people like that yeah. to be on the street, you know, begging for money and queuing up at food food banks, which? It's happening in some ways already. So we've got a long way to go. It's a marathon. Um, and I've been talking to various ministers at state and federal level. I won't give you a list of which federal ministers are more supportive than others. Um, but I've got to say that um, gradually we're getting more and more supporting the idea. Cool. Gary? Mm. Uh, so I, I guess. It's definitely a big concern for, for council in terms of international students being on the verge of uh, homelessness. Um, we have had many students who have come to us to share stories with us about how only one person in a house of four uh, is working, so he's paying the rent, he or she is paying the rent for everybody else. Um, and they're not sure how long this can be sustained. So I think it's, it's just a matter of time um, before they become homeless. We've uh, at the moment, our health team is busy uh, auditing what food banks are open. Uh, Empower, for example, in South Bank is open every Sunday. And there's a big group of international students that visit for groceries every week. So that's a big concern. I think that was a concern even before the pandemic hit. So now it's just going to be elevated many, many folds. Um, the current situation also makes it very difficult. I think at times like this, usually the community can come out and, and offer help. You know, people can go, we'll provide free food. Uh, at this stage, I think we can't because you're not allowed to leave the house. You, a lot of places are not equipped to provide this kind of services. So we're kind of, a lot of students are feeling quite, quite trapped um, as to how they can help each other as well. But I think the loss of jobs is the biggest impact because a lot of students rely on that for their living expenses. So. Uh, the question to us is where to now and how long would this last? Yeah, it's a, uh, it does. It, sorry, Phil, were you going to say something? Oh, sorry, James. Um, we've got a question there from one of the participants about uh, uh, accommodation and how we're working with APSA and so on. We've formed a separate working group that I chair. Um, so on the task force, we've got the president of the Student Accommodation Association, Jeff Dennison, based at the University of Adelaide. Um, but we've also got APSA, the other peak body um, involved. So we've formed a working group. We've had a number of meetings uh, with all the purpose built student accommodation, CEOs, with um, residential colleges of universities, 
such as what I live in with my wife, <laughs> um, and also with um, many other international student accommodation providers. And those, that working group is sorting through many of the accommodation issues, such as rent reduction, such as perhaps moving some students to one facility where the other purpose-built student accommodation facility wants to have emergency housing. Um, we've, we had a big win on the accommodation front when we managed to get the Victorian Premier not to take to National Cabinet a recommendation to close down all residential facilities, be they purpose-built student private providers or be they university residential colleges and halls of residence. The Victorian Premier was looking to close them down as a non-essential service. And the argument we put to the Premier was, if you do that, you'll have 40,000 students on the street going to the private rental market. Do you really want, do you really think that's going to contain the virus compared to supervised purpose-built student accommodation setting with resident tutors who can monitor social distancing and so on? So we won that one. That was a big win to begin with. Um, they have refused to call student residential services a essential service they've called it a non-essential non service. So I'll leave that grey area um, for people to, to ponder. <laughs> it's it's mm. just, that, that, that strikes me as such a, an odd thing to, to push hundreds, push thousands of international students out on, into the private rental market. And also makes me realise that, you know, when an international student comes to Australia, they're not taking up a head lease all the time. Often they're joining as a flatmate, which means that mm. there's a loophole there for evictions because you can't, if someone in the house isn't paying their rent, then the person actually on the lease can just say, look, if you're not paying, you have to yeah, leave. And then they don't, they don't count as in, the, in the figures of eviction. So um, we'll go back to the, the charities. I did see that Food Bank had about a nine or 10 times the number of requests for use of their, uh, of their charity. Uh, however, they'd seen like a, something like a 28% reduction in the donations because people, mm. people couldn't, so they're getting squeezed as well. So um, I agree with you, Phil and Gary, and I, I don't, I, I think that it would be sad to, to see these images on TV of students using these charity services on a regular basis and coming, rel becoming reliant on them. And I hope it doesn't get to that point where only then will politicians act. Um, so that does take me to my next question in terms of, you know, there are Australians studying in other countries, US, Canada, New Zealand, UK. Phil, we'll start with you. What, um, do you. what do you think about the way that these other countries are treating their international students? Yeah, well, uh, my team, we're based at RMIT, who kindly give us free rent. <laughs> and uh, uh, RMIT, uh, their learning abroad, team are on the same floor as our, our building. They had a terrible situation where, for example, they had a cohort of study abroad students uh, stuck in Milan when the Italian um, version of the virus crisis took hold and they had incredible challenges getting them back to Australia. But the Italian authorities were fantastic and uh, as was a host university. And again, I mean, we've got so many examples, James, of other countries, other universities offshore who've done the right thing by our young people and really supported them either because they had to stay there, they were unsafe to leave, or getting them back to Australia. That again, we've got to be very careful here that we don't finish up with this you know, bad image uh, as well. Obviously, when it comes to uh, our own young people who missed out on study abroad experiences, we have to feel particularly sorry for them. I wrote an article in the Australian newspaper about this recently because many of them were getting new Colombo plan scholarships and mobility grants to go to universities in the Indo-Pacific region. Many of them were in their final year of study here in Australia and they'll lose that learning abroad opportunity for all time. Um, just when we're starting to get momentum behind the new Colombo plan program, we're starting to create more and more global citizens Whereas you know, before young Australians used to fly over Asia on their way to Europe and America, you know, we've really engaged with universities and countries in our own region through programs such as that. And uh, of course, the rug's been pulled from underneath um, this year's cohort of new Colombo Plan students, uh, quite apart from the university's own uh, learning abroad programs. Hmm. Gary, do you have any thoughts on the way other countries are treating international students? 
so the the information I get, I guess, are from the student leaders who who have feedback about their their colleagues and their peers in different different places. And I guess a lot of students in New Zealand says uh, because the fact that international students are covered by the work subsidy scheme that they actually do get uh, funding. To some of them, they they even get profit, I guess, because uh, they would not have earned just as much whilst whilst working. Um, I'm I'm also thinking is it from the political front. The leadership in certain countries are a little better um, that students don't feel that they have let being let down um, and that reassurance I feel is really important I, at Melbourne City Council I think that's why I'm confident that's why the Lord Mayor has come up really quickly to say that we're here for you um, a lot of technicalities of what the support is takes time but I think students need to know that they're they're wanted back to that comment with from the Prime Minister I guess the worry was a lot of students were disappointed um, and some students have actually used the word betrayed uh, in the sense that, wow, uh, when the going gets tough, this is what happens uh, in a place where we call our second home. So that impact was really, really, really bad. And when we talk about uh, all the work that we do in the international education sector and in the diversity, culture diversity space, it's all about our focus on building a sense of belonging for international students. But this authenticates it, that students already feel that they're cash cows and now with what has been said students have feel so we are other we are the other group um, mm -hmm. we're only here for a reason so that that's a concern but for, from feedback i think other countries seem to be doing a better job from my personal opinion i think it's just better leadership on the political front yeah um, it's, it's, I think sorry, there's, sorry, sorry, James. there's a very interesting irony in all of this and that is that as australia has um, moved to contain the virus then compared to our competitor study destination countries in Europe, mm. be it the UK, be it uh, USA, be it Canada as well, we may well find that, ironically, for a government like China, our country will be deemed to be safer to send students to uh, next year compared to other countries. And so mm. <laughs> I say it's an irony because these other countries may have shown far more support mm. to international yes. students in their, those countries but we could be the beneficiary now mm. how we then address that will be crucial because if we have a, a lockdown for six months as per the current stage three restrictions but then we close our national borders for 12 months that would take us right up against the start of semester one next year and I've had different government advisors saying, look, don't worry, Australia will be the first country because of our semester starting uh, not in August, as with the Northern Hemisphere, but starting in February, we'll be the first country to be the beneficiary of getting over the virus. Well, I put to you that clearly if our national borders are still closed for 12 months, we may even miss the start of semester one next year, um, let alone the lead up by way of English language classes for you know, 12 weeks before that or whatever. So one of my key lobbying um, KPIs at the moment, if you like, is to try and ensure that we are in a good place before the start of semester one next year to restart our sector again. I mean, we can potentially put up with you know, major loss in terms of student numbers in first semester, maybe second semester, but a third semester of that is just going to really cause us grief yeah i've certainly seen some uh organizations reach out to us and just just as a signal to say you know what can we do to bounce back next year which is interesting they're thinking you know 12 months ahead um you know that's it's an, it's a challenging time but it's nice to see there is some optimism um but yeah oh, hopefully yeah. the hopefully the the travel restrictions do get lifted and the international students can come, but obviously that's uh, uh, the health the health concerns come first. We do have a question here uh, from Mahdi uh, Shariyatian. Uh, is there any plan to coordinate the communication to the international students during the pandemic? So I can say that Austrade is doing a fantastic job of uh, disseminating a huge amount of information and working with the various study bodies uh, and they are all coming up with their own COVID hubs. We, we've actually got our own on insiderguides.com.au. Uh, basically bringing together all the different information. Um, it is confusing for international students. Every university is doing different things. Every state's doing different things. 
Melbourne City Council is doing different things. Uh, it's not easy to know where to go for support. So um, yeah, I would say Austrade is the number one uh, at the moment, and then uh, and then working with all the others, uh, depending on where the students live. Um, I'd like to sort of Phil. I'd like to talk a little bit more about this hard hardship fund and and really dive into the role that you think government should have in this. I mean, what is the role of government in a scenario like a pandemic versus institutions and charities? I mean, there's an argument to say institutions. You know, they are the ones who have profited from this. They are a business. They've they've, they've had the chance to they, they they should look after their own customers things like that but then the other flip side is well it's a market failure no one could have predicted this where does the government step in yeah so look one of the great problems we have compared to the agriculture industry or the tourism industry quite apart from the fact that our current prime minister was the head of tourism australia <laughs> is in getting cut through is that unfortunately there's this sort of perception that the entire international education sector in australia revolves around the group of eight universities. And so we've had you know, leaks from the current federal government party room where a number of prominent backbench MPs said, there's no way that our government should be supporting um, universities because they've been rolling around in money for years. Um, they need to look after themselves. Now, there's another issue at stake here, and that is that if you do a demographic map, you'll find that all of the top universities tend to be in safe labor electorates. So in terms of the cut through um, that our universities have, uh, university leadership have when it comes to getting government to listen and be influenced, often if we go to the um, old adage that charity begins at home, you've got a situation in which certain government MPs don't have much empathy for universities, largely because they're not part of their voter communities. Um, so that's sort of the real politic that we're having to deal with here. Um, but in terms of the National Hardship Fund, my concept is that whilst the federal government would provide the seed funding, you would get state and territory governments to administer the fund through okay. sub subcontracting with, you know, whether it's the Red Cross or whether it be accommodation, not for profit providers and so on. And that way, it gives the state and territory government skin in the game, so to speak, that they have to actually be part of the equation. You'd leverage that to get the state and territory governments to put substantial money in themselves. And they could work with some of the big city councils like City of Melbourne, City of Brisbane and so on. And look, already we've had the Queensland government put forward $3 million. I understand the South Australian government are about to announce their own hardship fund funding as well. So I think You've got to have the federal government, I guess, at the top of the apex, if for no other reason than just for international reputation to, sh to show we are doing something as a nation. And then you have the trickle down of funding through the state and territories, and then you get the philanthropic foundations. Now, I've already had one large private provider who's promised to put $500,000 into the fund once it's put together. So, again, you'll get. Um, private providers as well as public universities. But the, the image that we have and the image challenge we have is that the politicians and the wider community think that International Education Australia is all about public universities and is all about the group of eight. We all know that, who, those of us who work in the sector, is that the sum of the parts is government high schools, it's independent schools, it's English language colleges that might be husband and wife owned for 30 years, it's quality private providers, it's not just public universities. And so I guess the lobbying angle has to be wider community, you need to know who we are, rather than just focus on one element of what we do. Yeah, and that's, uh, I guess, yeah. when it does trickle down to a more local level. And so I think it's a fantastic concept. It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's somewhat, um, I don't know, disheartening to know that it's gotten to the point where philanthropic donations are needed to prop up international students that bring the economy as a, you know, the tax into this country in, in such a large way and that we're looking at now charities. But Melbourne City Council, Gary, um, you know, you mentioned earlier that you're the, you're the first government to in, in Australia to, to uh, pledge financial support for international students. I'd love to know a little bit more about that, how that looks, and uh, do you have any any updates on 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 how that is going to eventuate? 
Oh, it's exciting that the Lord Mayor and councillors have taken the leadership in, in this space and for us officers to be able to support our international students a little better. Uh, as Phil has said before, for City of Melbourne, it is important that we collaborate, that it's a coordinated approach. Therefore, we have committed to a to a hardship fund, but that has to be led by the federal or state government, obviously, because exactly as Phil has said, we don't want to hodgepodge it and, and have five different agencies doing different different things. So City of Melbourne is committed to working with partners. At the City of Melbourne, we are working hand in hand with Study Melbourne. So we're promoting Study Melbourne's website as the one-stop shop for international students in Victoria. And that's really important to us. So they have the resource, they have a really sound website that can address all sorts of problems for international students. So we encourage all international students to, to go to that, to that space. Um, in terms of initiatives run by City of Melbourne, I guess it ranges from pastoral care, the well-being side of it, to pathways to employment. And our third strategy, I guess, is it comes down to rebranding, repromoting that's long term down the track, we feel. But in terms of well-being, that's our priority at the moment. So that involves lots of uh, connection of students needing help to study Melbourne. We are talking about a lot of online engagement activities, everything from cooking to dancing uh, online to keep students busy. Uh, we launched Friday nights at home, um, a one hour series uh, every Friday at 8.30 p.m. where international students are taking leadership in that space where they interview stakeholders about what's happening um, in the sector. And then we profile international students who will, will perform. Uh, one of the best things I think that has come up from this is how City of Melbourne has been able to activate our graduates, our student leaders in taking the lead. Um, as we said before, international students are resilient. Uh, I get so many emails from students who have said, we want to do something, we can do something, what can we do? So we want to be able to see that we can provide them a platform to do that, to help one another and to look out for one another. Um, so in terms of other programs, we have startup programs that we are working with AKs uh, that links international students up with startups. We are looking into a lot of ways where we can engage with them online we're trying to broaden the scope and the interests because we know students that have lots of different interests um, but other than that it's really working in collaboration with, with partners and the hardship fund is something that we hope will be launched uh, will be led by federal state uh, state government so that we can be part of it too gary have you got have you got any insights into what the red cross is doing we've had uh, uh, some a question here about um yesterday's announcement uh, I'm, I'm not sure what it is do you have any insights on that no, that's all no, right. I, I, Phil, do I you know, that question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I kind of do. Uh, Anne Ruskin, the Minister for Social Services, announced um, uh, funding. I think it was about $7 million will go to the Red Cross to um, support people on temporary, temporary uh, visitor visas, uh, including international students. Um, my worry with some charities, and I won't mention anyone in particular, is that they can take a long time to actually uh, distribute the funds that they're given by government or by philanthropic foundations. And they can also take a fairly hefty admin fee off the top. So I just guess to Gary's point about the hodgepodge, I guess my concern is that we really need to um, ensure that if funds are going to be distributed via some of these charities that we get a handle on how quickly the funds will be released and how much admin fee, if any, has been taken off the top before that money, to use that point about trickle down, actually gets mm. distributed. And there's some of the challenge we've got when we do have a hodgepodge. <laughs> we've had different mm. players doing different things and that's why the National Hardship Fund needs to have clarity around it and um, appropriate leadership from state and territory governments in implementing the funding. Yeah, no, um, it's, uh, I know. It's. I totally agree. I think uh, charities have their own issues going on. Uh, regard, as I said before, about the, the, the they they used to be relying on a steady flow of of uh, revenue and then and a steady number of recipients, and now that's completely off balance as well, um, which indicates a wider societal problem. We do have a qu uh, a comment here from Brett 
McGeorge. Uh, thank you for mentioning the contribution of other sectors of Australia's international education industry. While we represent only a small percentage of total student numbers in Australia, the school sector in particular provides an important pipeline of students into Australian universities. We often feel our voices not being heard on many of the issues our sector is facing. I did have a couple of emails this week in, in, when, while promoting this webinar from different schools. They, Phil, do you, do you have any insights into sort of how the schools must be handling this crisis? Yeah, so look, um, on the IA board, we've got a national board of 13 elected members. We've had for some years now the principal of Halebury um, Independent School. Halebury's the largest private school in Australia. Um, and they've also got three campuses in China. So Derek Scott, the principal, is also on the Council for International Education with me. And we also have regular meetings with the AGSI, which is the Australian Government Schools International, uh, people from around Australia, and with ISCA, the Independent Schools Association. I guess. For many of the schools, they did it hard because they had the homestay situation where they rely heavily for under 18 year old students being um, hosted by Australian homestay families. And when the virus first uh, took hold, we suddenly had a whole lot of Australian families who said, sorry, we can't take our home stu homestay student anymore. And so there was a major scramble on to try and get alternative accommodation for under 18 year old school students. Another key issue was of course that the Chinese students who were denied the right to come to Australia, bear in mind that over 50% of the international students in our high school system in Australia are from China. Many of them were sort of halfway through year 11, year 12 or about to commence year 12. And so at least we were able to get the government to acknowledge that year 11, year 12 international students were a special cohort. And believe it or not, but they're still allowed to come into Australia. So um, there's been no barrier set other than the 14 day quarantine period when they arrive. Um, they have to meet a whole range of conditions, mm. but there's been an acknowledgement by government that year 11, year 12 um, international students, even Chinese students who are in lockdown, should be supported. I guess at another level, I should add, James, that it'd be good to briefly mention the whole online learning. Mm. initiatives that are going on because for example whether you be a school student or whether you be a post-secondary student enrolled in an Australian institution and you're offshore still the fact that you can do your online learning is fantastic but we've got to negotiate still with our friends at home affairs department about the visa settings around that so for example Tesco and Asco have said there's no impediment to commencing a course in an online manner offshore and of course, then you don't need a student visa because you're not coming to Australia. Yeah. But what we, need, what we need to achieve with Home Affairs is to get them to agree, for example, that if you've commenced your first semester um, or your first term, if you're a school student offshore, that then that won't cause you any grief down the line when you do come to Australia eventually. And for example, you want a post-study work right visa, that the period you spend online offshore will not discriminate your opportunities of getting other um, visa flexibilities in other words so that's a key issue we're trying to work out with home affairs at the moment that for example so many of our post-secondary international students want a post-study work right visa to work in our economy full-time for two years after they graduate here but we don't want to compromise that opportunity for them because they only spent part of the time in australia and had to study online offshore yeah, that would be uh, a challenging, um, I guess, uh, uh, an issue regarding visa and the visa status and how you do move online from a government perspective, but also from the institutions. I mean, we had Tom Gifford on the on the show uh, last week. It is a show now. Uh, Tom Gifford and RMIT last week to, uh, talking about or the week before. Sorry, talking about how you move universities online. But he, you know, it does strike me that not all institutions can do that. Um, we heard from the Ellicott provider coming. Uh, coming to me this week saying uh, saying they've, they've been challenged as you, said, as you mentioned at the start of the webinar Phil uh, they're, they're being challenged by students who are dissatisfied with online learning they want a discounted course they want a full deferral um, they don't have adequate IT infrastructure like what you were mentioning Gary uh, mm. and uh, they don't have the funds to pay for any upgrades to get you know to get a new computer mm. I'm just curious uh, for hearing from both of you. Start with you, Gary. How does an institution navigate to the new normal 
if it's just not part of their structural DNA? Oh, I have, I don't know how to answer that question because I think the new normal is something that we will create through this, <laughs> this process. Uh, and we will reflect in it, uh, reflect back to this and go, oh, this is a new, new normal. So um, very concerned, very concerned with, with what international students have to go through. But having said that, I think international students are the best to, to adapt to this new way of working. Uh, half the time doing Zoom and stuff, I have to call international students to help me through it. And so hopefully it's a system that they can manage. But I think it widens the gap. It widens the gap for those who are equipped to do online learning. And for those who can't or can't access it, they're going to be left behind. So, uh, and the faster we progress, I think the, the vulnerable students are getting more concerned because they go, I can't even log in. So why are we talking about online courses and what options do I have? And should I go home? And I can't even go home. So I think the questions are endless in that space. But yeah, I don't know what the new normal is. I'm like keen to find out soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think every institution is scratching their head trying to work out how to get over firewalls in China and everything like that. Phil, do you have any thoughts on this? Look, I think what's been overlooked by, unfortunately, by many students in this whole dilemma is that particularly private providers, be it English language colleges, um, whatever, have had to suddenly find money to invest in online teaching technology in many cases and so you know the very time when they're losing students and their enrollments are dropping and they can't get any new students from offshore the expectation from the students they've still got is you'll provide me with and my classmates with an up-to-date state-of-the-art technology option which is incredibly high cost for the providers so i've got some sympathy for providers who and suddenly they haven't budgeted for that expense and they're having to borrow money to try and set up um, first-class technology options as well. Um, to Gary's point, I think the new normal clearly would be more online learning going on. But I think we have to not overlook the fact, James, that the very reason why international students come to Australia is often if they come from a rote learning pedagogical background in the yeah. Indo-Pacific. They want creative learning, they want critical thinking, that really comes through face-to-face -face far more than online learning based. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking of a baby, a baby boomer here with my own prejudice, <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> most, most pedagogical studies show that face-to-face -face, um, yeah. is a better alternative. And there's a danger that if we rely too heavily on online, we'll actually diminish what Australia's great teaching and learning is about. And that is that ability to critically think in a small group mm. situation, do, do teamwork projects, which is what globalised employers now want. I'm sure Gary would agree. They mm. want young people who can hit the ground running, who've got the uh, skill set to work in a team, to be flexible and to be critical thinkers. Um, and it's sort of like a, an education dividend that Australia hasn't necessarily earned. We've got we've achieved it probably more by luck than anything else, but we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater there. We need to hang on to that pedagogical advantage we've got over other countries. That's right. I guess it does raise mm. that question. If everyone moved too quickly online, then will international students register with an overseas provider to study an online course? And, and then you end up shooting yourself in the foot, which is a, another problem. Uh, but that can be, you know, I think that's an adjustment to the new normal. Um, normal. Peter, yeah, the new normal. Um, we had Peter Mackey uh, from Study New South Wales uh, on the webinar a couple of weeks ago. And it was really interesting hearing him, hearing him talk about the way that the state government is having to change the way that these study bodies acted. Um, you know, they originally set up as a destination marketing piece, then they ended up doing some student support. And now Peter Mackey is talking about study New South Wales, uh, essentially doing student welfare primarily and making sure students have a place to live, have food, things like that. And he talked about, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it did strike me to, about, uh, it reminded me when I first set up Inside of Guides, there was this thing, you know, the, the gray area of student support between institutions, accommodation providers, local government and state government. Phil, what do you think the role of a study body should be in 2020 and this pandemic? Well, number one, the role of the study body should not be to say, come to our city or come to our state because we'll do it better than another state. And happily, because we've been able to establish forums that bring together 
a committee of state and territory study destinations, um, then at least there is agreement that they won't try and outbid one another or market one another differently. Um, you know, for example, if Western Australia hadn't had any cases of COVID-19, theoretically speaking, what would be to stop them saying, well, come to Western Australia and, you know, we can guarantee the health of your child or whatever. So um, that's always a danger in a federal system of government that you have these sort of breakout uh, situations, states outbidding one another, um, and that hasn't happened and we've kept a lid on that. Having said that, of course, many of these study destination bodies do rely on pivoting the advantages of their city of their state over others. And um, clearly, what we know, for example, is that in Queensland, there's far more of a um, English language um, diploma sort of cohort compared to the southern states that are more into the university degrees as well. So there has to be differentiation of the roles of each of these study bodies. You know, study CAN, the very different beast to study Melbourne. But we also have to acknowledge that they're at the grassroots, they're at the coal face, and they should be appropriately funded, not just by the city councils, but by other levels of government to really project, I guess, a unique culture, the unique uh, advantage that students might have. You know, I mean, it's the old thing that Brazilian students don't come to Melbourne because of our weather, but Colombian students do because the weather in Bogota is similar to the weather <laughs> in Melbourne. So, I mean, there's lots of different permutations that those of us who work in the industry know. Um, and uh, I guess Gary made the point earlier about the whole push to send students into the region as well. You know, we know that certain students regard regions as being third tier cities um, in all the negative aspects of that goes within countries like China. And then in equal measure, we know that many students who rely on a part-time job for their living expenses are not going to necessarily want to go to back of Burke or back of Dubbo because they will perceive their chance of getting a part-time job as very small even though they might have a great study experience. So we have to really slice and dice the different locations according to one, their culture, two, what they have to offer students in terms of jobs or education outcomes, and really three, how welcoming that local community is. Mm. And at the moment, mm -hmm. as we know, Australia has not seen to be a very welcoming study destination anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a tricky one. I'm not sure if the study bodies would agree that they shouldn't compete with each other. <laughs> it's something that's part of the DNA. But, uh, you know, I agree. that's something uh, that will, yeah, obviously evolve uh, as we get through this together. And we are in this together. Um, Gary, I'd like to sort of take you, I mean, we're almost at the end of the webinar and um, I, I appreciate some people have, have dropped off. Um, but uh, I just want to hear from you, Gary. As we look to the future, I mean, let's talk about this practical optimism now. Let's, 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 how are we going to get through this? Do you think the sector, how do you think the sector is going to change as a result of this crisis? And, and what, might we, what might we learn? And Gary, I'd like to hear from you first. Oh, that's a really big question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that uh, this, this pandemic has forced the sector to stop for a minute and reflect on what we're doing right, what we can do better. And it's going to be tricky. Uh, we talked about reputation, we talked about numbers, and we, we're concerned that this um, will have a big impact for a very long time. Um, personally, I'm very concerned with, with job losses, with friends who, who may suffer job losses out of this. But I think it, 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 it's a really good time for us to reflect on what we can do better to support international students that we do recruit into the country. It, it makes us forces us to think about uh, over-reliance on certain markets. It forces us to think about uh, how prepared are we to support international students if this happens again? Uh, I think it's given that this took us by surprise and no one knows what to do. Uh, there are lots of questions about consulates helping. Uh, are they helping? Um, There's a question from Suzanne. And yes, consulates are supporting students. But it comes down to the hot spot sh uh, comment that uh, Phil has said before. Uh, it's not coordinated. I think the sector can be coordinated a little better if this ever happens happens again. Uh, change the way we work. I think we need to listen to our students, how they like to study. Phil has always said face-to-face -face is a very important part of our offering, uh, and we cannot forget that. Um, but I think it's a really good time for us to start listening to our students a little better. And the workers, I think what we 
forget to do is listen to the grammar teachers, the advisors, who can tell us what we can do to make sure this is managed better ever if it happens again. That's right. Yeah, and I, I'm noticing a lot more. Um... I mean, the, the, there's a warming sense of humanity coming out of this crisis from the wider community, from the people I've spoken to who have nothing to do with international education yeah. are coming to me saying, like, where do I, how can we help? How can the community step up yeah. and help out? And I know, I think the Australian Homestead Network's launching something like they did with their, with their asylum seeker program a few years ago, where they, um, they're trying to get uh, people to, to open their houses to international students. And I can see different businesses trying to be innovative to support students. Um, and I think that's one silver lining that can come from this is a real sense of humanity at the end of it. And people will actually understand mm. that if this happens again, what are we going to do? Um, Phil, mm. what do you think is, uh, is some practical optimism to take out of what is a very difficult situation? <laughs> well, I think first and foremost is that we need to better communicate to the wider community, Australian community, that 240,000 Australians work in some manner in the international education sector. Now, that's not my figure, that's Dan Tian, our Minister for Education's figure. So we've come a long way. We are now a profession. And those 240,000 Australians who work in the sector also deserve the right to get professional learning um, qualifications because if you work in our sector in America, you can do degree programs, master's programs in international education, governance management, uh, here in Australia, we don't have any such courses. So I think we need to reflect on the needs of the people that work in the industry, as Gary said, and better professionalise them. And certainly my association, IA, is trying to do that um, as well. Um, and we need to also award them and uh, ensure that they are respected for the incredible work they do as professionals. And we also need to, I guess, for all the wrong reasons, given we're going to have some very bad media in the next few weeks, we need to make sure that um, the wider community, to Gary's point, understand how beneficial this sector is to Australia's future mm -hmm. uh, with soft power and so on going forward. So uh, I guess what I'd like to see is Australia take a role as an equal amongst other study destination countries in having academic at risk, um, sorry, scholars at risk chapters uh, allowing for refugees to get um, shadow student cards until they get their citizenship and getting some of those programs established through the sector so that Australia's reputation is just wanting to make money out of these young people is somehow um, changed to be like, if you like, a whole, um, a whole of life, a whole of community mm. endeavour. Um, because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is produce global citizens to break down this unfortunate trend to nationalism nowadays. And we need to remind ourselves of what we're doing by creating global citizenships, where, citizens, whether it be having young Australians study abroad or bringing young people from other countries here, then we break down a lot of the stereotypes and that's what our sector should be doing. And that's my optimistic hope for when we bounce back. I won't use the term snap back, which is what the Prime Minister's used, but when we bounce back, which we will because we, we're a very resilient sector as well. We've learned the hard way over many years. Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, it, it makes me reflect on, on all the work that's been done to improve the overall student experience right across the, right across the country and, and the things that are sort of locked in place. So everything from public transport concessions, you know, uh, work rights, things like that, all the things that are in place now. So when something like that, like this happens, at least those things are fixed and, and sort of they're baked into to the fabric of international education. It's, it's, but, but I guess when a pandemic hits, it shines a light on what isn't available to international students. Yeah. And it makes the whole sector reflect on, on, on what, was the, what was missing to begin with. And, and I think that's a, um, an interesting point. But yeah, look, I want to thank you so, so much for, for joining thank us you. today uh, to Phil and Gary, uh, thank you again. Um, we've got so many questions here. I've gone through them all, but there's a few that we just can't answer. Um, we don't know the answers to, to how a hardship fund will work because it doesn't exist yet. We don't know um, about the uh, um, the impact in certain parts of the sector. It, it's, there's certain things that we can't answer, but um, I want to thank you all again for joining us. Phil, Gary, um, do you have any uh, insights that you'd like to sort of end with before we finish up? Phil? 
I think um, we all need to really work together in a much more cohesive manner. I think that we can achieve a lot, even though we compete against one another as providers, as, uh, edu as accommodation providers, whatever as well. The collaboration that's coming out in the last few weeks between competitors, I think, will serve us well going to the future. And thank you, James, for this great initiative. Ah, no worries. Mm -hmm. So, um, I agree, James. I think what we need to focus on as well is the positive side of this. And it is the collaboration. It is the best practices that stakeholders have come up with. Uh, I know what consulates are doing. I know some of the initiatives done by purpose-built student accommodations, private colleges to support their international students. So I guess in all this doom and gloom, sometimes that's how it feels. There's a lot of good things that are coming out from it. We don't necessarily get to hear them or read about them, uh, but we should. But there's a lot of good work out there, and I think everyone needs to, to reflect on that. Well, well done. Great. That's great. All right. Well, let's leave it there. And I want to thank you all again so much for joining us. We'll, we'll be back hopefully next week. <laughs> we can keep this, it's quite a lot of work keeping these going, but it's all good. Um, I, I love doing it, and we'll keep, we'll keep going through. So uh, thank you again. And uh, you'll get a survey at the end of it. Uh, please feel free to send me ideas. Let's keep the conversation moving and get some practical optimism going through the sector. Thanks again. And see you later. Thanks. See Bye. you. Thanks, Bye. James. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, James.